just started chapter 3 last week in Malachi, only four chapters, and chapter 4 is a very short chapter, so we're getting toward the end. Uh, verse 3 said, says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, that's a relationship to John, John the Baptist, he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. The second messenger refers to Jesus himself as a messenger. So we answered the first uh, eight questions. We're ready to deal with question number nine now. Uh, why did God send a messenger to prepare the way for uh, the coming of the Messiah? The reason he did is because they were not ready. Uh, there are some things that you just have to prepare people for. Uh, this is a silly illustration, but it makes my point. Since uh, only people that finish the 12th grade of school get a high school diploma, why can't I just skip the first 11 and start in the 12th grade and then get it? I mean, that'd be real quick, wouldn't it? Well, you know why I can't. There has to be a foundation laid. And there needed to be a foundation laid. Somebody had to make the people aware of the fact, do you know what the Bible says is going to happen? And do you know what you're supposed to do when he comes? And you know what he's going to do when he comes? Uh, oh, tell me. Well, they're not learning this from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Religious leaders are not telling the people this. But the prophets are. And Malachi is uh, telling the people. Now, there were not uh, Pharisees in Malachi's day, but the priests in Malachi's day were not saying anything like this. And God was speaking to the people through the prophet. Now, when did the Lord come to his temple, as his verse indicates? Well, this could be answered several different ways. He obviously came to his temple as a baby when he was brought there. Uh, and then he, we know that he's there when he was just a young man because he confounded the people with his wisdom. Uh, and then we know that he was there uh, on the feast days. Uh, and we learned that through the gospel <coughs> record. So I don't know uh, exactly which uh, time of his visitation there might have been in the mind of Malachi when he wrote this, uh, it may be just a way of saying that he's going to be a frequent visitor of the temple because that's where people need to uh, realize that truth should come from the temple where people come to bring their sacrifices to God. So who is the messenger of the, of the covenant that he's talking about here? He's talking about the new covenant, so that's Jesus Christ. I've already mentioned that to you. Uh, remember Jesus when he instituted the Lord's Supper, said, uh, this uh, is my blood of the New Covenant, or the New Testament. So he was indicating that uh, you're going to enter into a new relationship with me, and that relationship began on the day of Pentecost, when the Gospels first preached. Uh, John's ministry, I, I don't want to skip over John's ministry too quickly here, uh, he had a very important ministry. Uh, would it surprise you to realize that when John began preaching, he didn't know who Jesus was? He's related to him. Blood kin. He didn't know he's a Messiah. He knew him as a member of the family, as another man that walks on the earth. How did he ever come to the knowledge of the fact, hey, you know what I'm talking about? You're the one I've been preparing people for. What brought him to that awareness? The Holy Spirit? His baptism. Oh. Yes. And it was at his baptism that he heard the voice of God said, This is my son. Listen to him. Uh, and of course, he saw the Spirit descend upon him uh, in the form of a dove. Because you can't see, so you have to have a form visual to help him be aware of that. And uh, so John is very frank to say, you know, I didn't realize who he was until he actually made himself known. Jesus' baptism was unique. Uh, it's not a baptism that anybody else has ever experienced or ever will. It was not a baptism for repentance like John preached. It's not a baptism for salvation like we preach today. It was a baptism 
that began his public ministry with making his identity clear, first of all, to the one who's prepared the people for him. And through him, then Jesus will follow in rapid succession and continue where John the Baptist's ministry leaves off. And John the Baptist, bless his heart, was a very humble person. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. So he took a back seat. Now that's not easy to do. John was a very popular man. He's a very effective preacher. The thing that really striking to me is he didn't go to the city where the people were. The people came to the country where he was. And all he had to do is just have a few people listen to him and say, man, have you ever heard this guy? You need to hear him. He knows what he's talking about. And he really knows his scripture. And he's giving us real hope for something that's about to happen here. And so the people just came so great a number that finally the religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they realize, what are all these people going out in the country for? What are they going out the area for? And so they show up. And how does John respond to them? This gives you a side of John that you don't ordinarily talk about. He said, you snakes. <laughs> Who warned you to come here? What are you doing here? Well, he knew what they were doing there. And he let them know that he knew what they were doing there. They weren't there to repent. And he just said, okay, what's your evidence? Why do you need to repent? Why do you need to be baptized so that your sins will be forgiven? They didn't have anything to repent of. How could they? They're perfect in their own eyes, you know. So they're the ones that should have had the attention of the people. But the people are turning away from them, and they're following after John the Baptist. So he prepared the way. All right. I want to give John his just dues. And when, you know, when he talked to the common people, crowds that came up to him said, okay, uh, can you spell that out in specifics? What do I do if I repent? He said, well, say what you do. If you see somebody doesn't have anything to eat and you have a little bit extra, share it with them. And if you see somebody that is not properly clothed and you have extra clothes, share that with them. In other words, help people when they need. That's what you're supposed to do. And then the tax collector came to him and said, uh, what am I supposed to do? He said, quit exacting more funds from the people when you collect their taxes and you have a right to. Then a soldier came up to him and said, uh, what am I supposed to do? And he said, well, be content with your wages. Just quit complaining. So a lot of different things, see? And I like the fact that he dealt with the crowd and he dealt with the uh, tax collector and he dealt with the soldier, showing that the answer was basically the same and yet it was worded differently. But all of it, all it means is when you repent, you bring about a change in your life and what changes need to be made? Well, if I'm doing anything that's not according to the will of God, I need to change that. And so that's why we say that repentance is an absolute necessity to become a Christian. That precedes our baptism. And we recognize, I'm not the person I ought to be, but I want to be the person I should be. And I'm willing to make that change. I'm willing to submit to the Lordship of Christ. And then we indicate that through our confession of faith and our baptism into Christ. Verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Now whose coming does this verse mention? Well, this is a coming of uh, the Messiah. Uh, that's who he's talking about. That's why the, the letter H in his is capitalized, uh, and rightly so. Uh, so uh, when, what was the day that he came? Are we talking about a 24-hour period? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think we're talking about the day in the way in which I say, isn't this a great day to be alive? Or have you ever seen a day like this that confronted us with such strange actions that's going on in the world around us? You know, I'm not using to refer to any one day on the calendar. <clears throat> I'm just talking about a period of time that's flexible in how long it is. <clears throat> so the day of his coming, I think, is the day that... Uh, probably began uh, when Jesus' ministry began and uh, continues on until he comes back again. So the day, we're living in the day of the Messiah. We're living in the day of the new covenant. But he came at the end of the old covenant period of time uh, trying to show them how they uh, just had so departed from the pattern. And so he's going to give them a fresh start. And that's what he does in his grace and mercy that he displays to us. So what is the day of his coming? I think it's a day that uh, talks about 
the time that Christ came to the earth, literally, until the day that he's going to return, and that will be followed up with the final judgment. Number three, how are the words endure uh, and stand to be understood in these two questions? I think that he's saying that with the coming of Christ now, you're going to uh, have to endure some things. And you're going to be in a situation where you need, really need to take a stand. Now, do you see a difference a little bit between enduring and standing? Sometimes I may be put on the spot and uh, am I going to acknowledge, like people may think, are you really a Christian? I'm going to say, yes, I am. That's taking a stand. What is enduring? Enduring is suffering the consequences of having taken that stand. Well, we don't have anything to do with you. Then they begin to take advantage of you, to persecute you. So he's saying, when you choose to follow me, are you going to really stand up for me? We talked about this last Sunday morning in, our, in my Sunday school class where uh, some of the rulers believed that Jesus uh, was the Messiah but uh, they were afraid to say anything publicly because they knew that they might be excommunicated from the synagogue and they didn't want that to happen. Uh, one of those persons that did that was Joseph of Arimathea. He was a part of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Council of the Jews, and he believed in the Lord, and he didn't get his courage until he died. When he died, he did get the courage, and he said, let me furnish a place for his burial. And uh, so that fulfilled the prophecy of the Old Testament that with the rich he's going to be in the time of his death. Uh, so he's talking about uh, the people who follow me need to realize, realize just how important John's ministry is because you do have to stop living one way and begin living another way. The old story that I remember best is the morning that the preacher preached on the subject of repentance and he thought, uh, I want to make sure they really get it. And so he uh, stepped down to the pulpit and walked down the center aisle like he was going to exit the building. And all the way down the alley, he said, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell. Oops! And he turned around, walked back to the pulpit, and all the way back, he said, no, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. He said, that's repentance. When you change your direction in life, when you put first things first, so that's the kind of thing that I think that he's uh, really talking about here in this particular verse. Ah, uh, did uh, which one? Which question am I on now? Number four. 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 Three. Three. Yeah. Okay. I get to talking here, and I lose place and on my nose. How may the coming of the Messiah and his purpose be understood in light of the picture of Jesus being compared to a refiner's fire and a fuller soul? That's where I'm supposed to be. Thank you. Well, what's he going to say? What similarity is there between soap and fire? They both are cleansing agents. Uh, when you take a metal and you want to make sure that all the impurities of that metal are removed, you have to have intense heat. On the other hand, you don't have a fire if you're washing clothes. <laughs> so soap has its purpose and fire has its purpose. Are some people made better because of the extreme persecution they've had to go through? Some of the nicest people you ever meet are people that have really suffered tremendously cause of Christ, but they remain firm all the way through. And they just have come to appreciate God's grace so much and they exemplify that grace in their own lives and their kindness and their goodness and willingness to help other people. So both are pictures of the way that Jesus is saying, I came to do what is necessary to bring you to your senses and to make you to be the person that God wants you to be. And for some of you, it's going to be really tough on you because I'm going to insist that you have to do certain things a certain way and others of you are going to make it very easy because you're going to very willingly accept what I'm saying to you. Verse 3, he will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver 
He will purify the sons of Levi, refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present the Lord's offerings in righteousness. So why the emphasis on the sons of Levi? Well, they were the spiritual leaders all the way through the Old Testament. The priests were the ones in charge of the temple services and the religious instruction, and they've become quite corrupt. And uh, so there has to be a change taking place here. Now when he says uh, the sons of Levi, he's really talking about us today. So what Malachi has to say is relating to us, not because we can trace our ancestry back to Levi, but we are the priesthood of God. Because all Christians are referred to as God's priesthood, uh, as his holy nation, as his chosen race, as his own possessions. So uh, we offer our bodies as sacrifice. Romans 12, 1, present your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. So who will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver? Well, the Lord does. This is what Jesus does. This is whole, his whole purpose in his ministry. He will have one kind of an effect on this person, a different kind of effect upon that person, but the end result, whether it be a fiery trial, by the way, James says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that comes upon us who are Christians. So that's mentioned in the New Testament very specifically with the same emphasis here. But on the other hand, there are those who will uh, recognize what you say makes sense. I want to follow that. I will do that. So they obey the gospel. But it all happens in our baptism, doesn't it? That's where the blood is applied. But it continues to be true by our willingness to stand firm even when we go through times of persecution. Again, we are reminded in this verse that Jesus made it very clear to his disciples, said, if you follow me, they're going to treat you the way they treated me. And Jesus did not receive very good treatment, especially by the religious leaders. And that's telling us something too. Sometimes the people that claim to be the most righteous people can be our severest critics and can create our greatest problems. We have to be careful. Well, verse 3, does this verse picture Jesus as judge? Uh, yeah, I think it does. Uh, he didn't come to judge the world, but judgment takes place simply because he is portraying in his life the kind of life that God expects all of us to live. What is that? Absence of sin. Could anyone come up with any clear proof that Jesus ever said or did anything wrong? Just could not. So that's our example. And so in that sense, Have you ever been with a person that is so nice that you feel kind of guilty in their presence? You know, I think, man, they're so nice. Why can't I be that nice? They've been so considerate. Why can't I be that considerate? Does it not have an effect when you're around good people? That's why when I taught in college, I always would say to the freshman class, choose two friends. Your best friend, make sure it's a person that's going to make you better than you are. And your second best friend, make sure that person's going to be a better person because they know you. So you got a good balance there. I think we need to be with people that are going to help us to be better than we are. By the same token, I think we need to be people that we hope we can make them be better than they are by the very fact that we know them. Well, in this sense, there's a judgment. And uh, people do make that judgment. Uh, that's why sometimes... People are doing things and they're embarrassed when a Christian shows up. And why would they be embarrassed? Because they know the Christians don't approve of that and they feel kind of ashamed and they're embarrassed that they were caught. That's a judgment. Not that you came to do any judging. It's just a case of where you are judging. Now, number four, how does the New Testament further verify the truth expressed in this verse? Uh, I think he, uh, the New Testament emphasizes this by the importance of sanctification. Do you remember when you and I became Christians, we received the forgiveness of sins, but we also received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, what's the role of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit uses the Bible to say, this is what God wants you to do. So, when you and I read the Bible 
and we come to an understanding of what that Bible is saying, you know what? That's evidence that the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. I would like to believe, and I do believe, that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives right here and now. Mm -hmm. And I think the sanctification process is going on right here and now. Because even as I teach, I'm aware of the fact that I'm the student that needs the teaching more than anybody else here. But we all need it, you understand. So uh, it's a purification of sanctification. It's growing in godliness. Uh, to realize, as we already studied this afternoon about John the Baptist and his great courage and his bold preaching, I think, wow, what an example. Could I be that kind of a powerful person myself? Well, each one of us are our own people, but we can certainly be encouraged by people that set a good example uh, like he did in his ministry. All right, verse 4. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as the days of old as in former years. Now, what are the days of old and in former years? Folks, this is going way back to the age of the patriarchs. This is going back to the time of Moses. This is going back to the time of David. The time of Solomon. And that's about when it stopped. Because all of a sudden now, they are in the Holy Land and they've got their temple building. And what happens? It just goes downhill. I, uh, I was not there when it was said, but I heard somebody that was visiting one of the great cathedrals in Europe, and uh, they were visiting as a tourist, and they simply said to the guide, and I don't know what kind of a voice they said it in, but it was a pertinent question. They said, has anybody been saved in this building recently? I doubt it. What are they? Beautiful structures. Magnificent buildings. <coughs> Pretty amazing. <coughs> but uh, are they just becoming a place for tourists to visit? And for special concerts to be presented? Is the gospel really being preached in those places? Are people really repenting of their sins? Are they really becoming Christians? Something to think about, uh, but the days of old were back in the days when the people were obeying the Lord and were offering their sacrifices in the right way. But uh, since that time, since the time of Solomon, things were just going downhill. You remember what happened to the kingdom? Solomon's son became the next king, but it didn't last very long, did it? He accepted the counsel of the young men when he should have paid attention to the older men. And as a result, the kingdom divided and the northern kingdom, they had a whole bunch of kings. How many were good? Zilch. Not one. Well, the southern king had a bunch of kings. How many were good? A few. Do you not see the things going downhill? Downhill all the way? In fact, they went downhill so far that the day finally came that after the northern kingdom was already gone out of existence, and the southern kingdom is so corrupt that God carried the people away into captivity. So that's why I say in the good old days here, refer back to the time of Solomon and on back further, yes. The, the tribe of Dan, I know they went north. Yes. Did they stay there during the uh, intertestamental period or were they gone by then? There was, there was no tribe of Dan during the intertestamental period. So they ended in the Old Testament days? Oh, they sure did. Okay. They sure did. Okay. All, all ten of the northern tribes ended in the Old Testament days. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. The only, the only uh, kingdom that uh, continued on during the intertestamental period is the people that Malachi is talking to. Oh, okay. These are the people that have been in Babylon captivity. They've come back, and Zechariah's got them to build the temple again, and now Malachi's coming along and says, hey, now let's really be serious about it this time. But did they pay any attention to him? No. We're going to keep going downhill. And terrible things happen during that intertestamental period. Um, does Malachi see a better day ahead of, for those who brings their offerings to the Lord? Yes, he does. And uh, he's going to point that out. In verse 5, 
Then I will draw near to you for judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, and against those who swear falsely, and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. When will the Lord draw near to his people for judgment? Well, that's exactly what happens with the coming of Christ. That's what Malachi is talking about. Jesus is coming. What's going to happen? He comes. A judgment is going to take place. Are you going to be stand? Are you going to stand firm and acknowledge that you're following Him, or are you going to uh, endure the suffering because you are following Him? Are you on the Lord's side? Great. Are you not? Well, then you're going to face a judgment, a real serious judgment. And He's wanting to make sure that they will understand what is this division that's going to take place when the Messiah comes. And the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, make that very clear. So question number one, when will the Lord draw near to his people for judgment? When Jesus came. Because this is God identifying himself with man and saying, this is what God expects of you. I'm an example. Follow me. And you'll be exactly right with God. Number two, what judgment will take place with the coming of the Messiah? Well, a judgment will take place. That's why Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And how's that sword going to work? I'm going to split up families. I'm going to split up friends. What does he mean by that? Well, some of these people are going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and some are not. And there you have a division. Not a pretty picture, but Jesus wants us to know and Malachi is indicating that way back in his day that the stand we take with the Messiah is going to be a determination of those who have a wonderful future to anticipate or those who are going to suffer the consequences of having rejected the Messiah. Number three, how is the Lord's judgment further clarified in this verse? He says, uh, I'm going to make a very clear distinction between those who obey me and those who don't. Now, who are those who don't? Just so that there's no misunderstanding, he's going to identify them. The first ones he mentioned are called sorcerers. That's fortune telling. Second group is adulterers. A lot of adultery in the world. My, sad. Third group he mentions are false swearers. Those who appear to say, this is the real truth. And they're lying through their teeth. It's just not true at all. They use the name of God. This is a, false swearers are all the false prophets. These are people who are saying things that the Bible doesn't say. That's one of the things that I really want to get into in our uh, next class, which will be the study of the church. How many times people pretend to be in the church and they're really not in the church they're just playing a game and there are a lot of people that are claiming to be preachers in churches and they're not telling you what the Bible teaches they're false swearers fourth is oppressors these are the people that try to stand in the way of Christians being the kind of people they ought to be um, and then uh, finally he mentions those who do not fear the Lord of hosts. So he identifies very clearly all those who uh, are being judged because they have not remained firm in their commitment to the Lord. Verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Now, what's he saying here? He's saying, I want you to know something. My people have changed. And it's not a pretty picture. But I've never changed. What I determined should be the characteristic of my people in my first covenant with you has not altered one bit. But you've changed. You're not paying any attention to it. And to the sacrifices, you're just not following the prescribed method of offering your sacrifices the way God intended. So he's saying here, the people have changed, but I haven't. I 
have not forgotten my people. And those of you, my people, who are remaining, though you're a minimum, a small group of people, I want you to know I've never forgotten you. I'm still your God, and you're still my people. So uh, when he says, I, the Lord, do not change, he's saying, yeah, you're still my people if you're following me. But if you're not following me, don't claim to be my people because you're really not. Verse 7, from the days of your fathers, uh, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Now, when he talks about the days of your fathers, he's dating us back now to the time of Jeremiah, the time of Isaiah, the time of Habakkuk. These were the prophets that uh, were giving them uh, the warning that you're not doing what God has said and you need to get on the right path. Uh, follow the old paths once again. So uh, they've been a problem. And uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that reoccurs in history so much of the time. Uh, what promise does the Lord make that is recorded in this verse? The promise is, you return to me and I'll return to you. Has the Lord ever forsaken those who have been loyal to him? No, he has not. Will he? No, he will not. Is there any hope for those who have strayed aside and they're not following exactly what the Lord teaches? Yeah, there is. But it's not because God changes. God's always been the same. But God is saying, Come back and be in my will. And I'm going to bless you just like I bless all the rest of my people. So it's very important that we recognize that uh, we return to God and he'll return to us. God will take care of us. That's the name of him. God will take care of you. Beautiful. Number three, what excuse, what excuse do men give to God for not returning to God? Well, in this verse, they say, how are we supposed to do it? <laughs> Folks, that's why we meet together every Lord's Day, to tell people how you get back right with God. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to confess your faith in Christ. You've got to start living a holy life. You've got to be baptized into Christ. And they're saying, how are we supposed to do this? And he said, if you're having to ask that question, why? You have really strayed a long way in departure from the paths that I intended all my people should follow. So, what is implied with the answer men gave, give to God for not returning to Him? Uh, I think implied in this answer is, uh, what do we have to return to? I mean, we're living a pretty good life. Why do we need the Lord? I think that's really what's implied in their answer. How are we supposed to do this? And I think a lot of people are today. They're really rejecting what God has to say. It really bothers me when you show somebody in the Bible exactly what the Bible teaches. Now, baptism is a real clear illustration of this because our world is really divided on the subject of baptism. And I know some people may think that we overemphasize it. I don't think you can overemphasize anything. It's true. And the fact remains, uh, you can say this church doesn't believe that's necessary and I don't believe it's necessary. But what has God said about it? And that's the final line. And there are so many people that believe that, that they're going to be in heaven when there's no biblical basis for them having that kind of faith or confidence at all. There just isn't. They're not living the Christian life. They're not serving the Lord. Uh, they call themselves that, but you can give yourself a name and say, I'm Mickey Mouse. That doesn't make you Mickey Mouse. The, it's, it's really sad, but I think that... Uh, a lot of these people are literally blind to their own needs. And somehow or another, we've got to shine the light of the Lord Jesus Christ upon them. Well, he asked this question, uh, how shall we return? And so uh, he's going to give them a specific. He makes this, I think, very, very clear. In verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. So, did God answer their question, how shall we return? Yeah, he did. Now God just simply telling him something. He told them a long time ago. But they're not doing it. He's saying, okay, start doing it. 
this is what I told you to do, you're not doing it, come back and begin doing it again. Now, the tithe uh, is a tenth. Uh, the passage in the Bible explains this for you is Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 through 33. Uh, number three, what's the difference between a tithe and an offering? Do you know what the difference is? Yeah, uh, I'll tell you, nothing is an offering to God unless it's given freely. It has to come from the heart. Not with a grudge, not a necessity, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Uh, my understanding, as this applies to me, is I believe that God's standard is never lowered. And what God has said in the Old Testament still is a guide to me unless there's something in the New Testament that tells me otherwise. And so I personally understand that uh, I am serving the Lord and obeying Him when I give the tithe, and when I give anything above the tithe, I'm giving Him an offering. I, that's my understanding. I don't disagree with people that have different understandings, I'm just simply saying that's my own personal understanding of, of uh, what is involved here. Well, in uh, verse nine. nine, yeah, you are cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. So, how serious was it for one to rob God? Yeah, yeah I, I don't, I don't see how you can get it around it. You're cursed with a curse. <laughs> That's pretty sad. So he says in verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I'll not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now what indicates that God means what he says about the tithe? <clears throat> well, he says, bring the whole tithe not just a portion. Uh, you know, this is like saying, okay, this 10% belongs to him, and I'll give him half of what belongs to him. Then I'll use the other half the way I want to do it. I think he's saying, no, don't play that kind of a game with me. Uh, I want the whole tithe. Uh, what is the blessing God wants to give those who bring the whole tithe into the storehouse? Well, he wants it to be a blessing that uh, they're going to recognize and realize, uh, how could I have ever missed this? I think that things are going to be so much better that they'll just, uh, they'll look at themselves and say, my, 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 why was I so slow in coming around to acknowledging the blessing that awaits those who uh, give to God as he wants them to give. And the blessing, you know, uh, could have been more rain. You don't want to hear me say that in all the rain we came to in the church today, but uh, back in that day, uh, he might have blessed people with sending rain to produce better crops. And a lot of times that's the way God did show, shower his blessings upon people. God has many different ways of showering blessings upon people who do his will. This uh, automatically comes up in a discussion of tithing. Is tithing required by Christians today? <clears throat> in my, if I were to give an answer to this, which I'm going to do, uh, I would use Matthew 23 and verse 23 and let each person understand that as they choose. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But these are things you should have done without neglecting the others. Now, I don't care how you translate the word these and others. Either way you translate it, he's saying, you should be doing both. In other words, he's not saying either or, but he's saying both. Now, I, I dare say that um, 
The Pharisees were very meticulous in their tithe. But they left out the most important part of all, and that's the heart. And that's what he's really emphasizing to them. And uh, it's easy for us to conclude that therefore the heart no longer requires the details of the Old Testament law. So I leave that to each person's own discretion. Uh, the other passages I would cite for the teaching that the Lord wants us to understand and giving. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7 and 8, he said, Each one must do just as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Uh, in Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And all the things he's talking about has been in the text in which he said this in the Sermon on the Mount. He's been talking about the food that they eat, the clothes they wear, all the necessities of life. Verse 12, all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Will other people observe the blessings God provided for the Jews? Yes, yes they certainly will. Don't you think that King Darius observed that God must be very important in, in the fact that he saved Daniel all night long from the and the lions? Don't you think that uh, the people in Egypt must have realized that God blesses his people in a special way, in the very way in which Joseph and his whole family were united, and the impact they had upon that country? Don't you think that David, uh, in his conquest of Goliath, would be a clear demonstration of the fact that as great a challenge as you might face personally, is God always there to give the protection you need? Don't you think that King Hezekiah, when he was literally scared to death because the Assyrians were already camped at his doorstep and had laid down the gauntlet and said, you must surrender to us or we're going to destroy your city. And yet, the next morning, 185,000 of those Assyrians lay dead in the street. Uh, all of this really fits in together, folks. Uh, I just really think that each one of us, and I'm talking to myself, can do, be better than we are, do better than we are. And I think we ought to realize that any standard that God sets if we live up to that standard, he will bless us abundantly. Verse 13, your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? So what charge does God bring against the Jews in this verse? He said, you're kind of arrogant in what you're saying against me. Uh, probably using some offensive language in the way in which they talk about God to other people. Do the people deny the charge of speaking against the Lord? Yeah. yeah, they sure do. So in verse 14 it says, You've said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have uh, kept his charge and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts? So how did the Lord explain their arrogant speech against him? He just simply says, You know, you're only kidding yourself if you think you're living for me. You're not fooling me. But you sure are fooling yourself. So he's saying it's vain. When you say it's vain to serve God, you just really don't know how much you're dependent upon God and how God's will is really the best for you. Uh, 
I like the comment that uh, one commentator makes in this verse. He says, they thought they were serving God, but they thought that God was demanding too much. And God is saying, you're returning too little. Well, verse 15. So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. So who are the arrogant in this verse? These are the people that are trusting in their own righteousness. I'll make my own standard. God's not going to make my standard for me. I'll do what I think is best. And the fact that this warning was given by Malachi was so needed is obviously made very clear in understanding everything that happened in the intertestamental period, that period of 400 years before Christ came, and even with the coming of Christ. Because the people that should have known their Bible better than anybody else were his bitterest opponents. We can't miss that. And that's a warning to people like me that may think, well, I've studied the Bible, I've taught the Bible, I know the Bible. Oh, do I? Am I really getting insight here? Let me tell you something. I'm not sure that I have attended this church one time when I did not gain a fresh insight into what God's Word was saying. I mean, the Word was there all the time. But, man, I go away Sunday night, Carol and I just say, man, that's great. We're being fed. Uh, you know, sometimes it's just a little detail. I thought, it was there all the time. And I never did quite see it. But the way it was explained, and the way it was illustrated, whoo, it just came to light. And I think, uh, boy, if I had any pride, it's gone out the window. <laughs> There's no place for it, you know. So we humble ourselves in the sight of God, don't we? That's the only way we're ever going to learn. But uh, the arrogance of the religious leaders in that day is, is really a tragic picture. And Jesus really made it very clear. These are the kind of priests that Malachi is saying, this is what you've been having ever since the time that the kingdom split up after Solomon. This is our history. And it continues to be the history. Even though through Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, they're pleading with the people to do what the Lord tells them to do, to obey Him. Now, is history going to repeat itself? It always does. It always does. Are there many people in the world today that claim to be Christians, really know their Bible well, and yet they're really not living the basics of the Bible? Yeah. Woo, that hurts. That hits home. We have to be careful that we do not become arrogant people. The arrogant are those who uh, accuse God because they just think God is expecting too much. And I just have to confess, it's so easy to be a Pharisee. It's not easy to be a Christian. But it's the Christians that are going to be saved, not the Pharisees. Verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him, for those who fear the Lord and who esteem His name. Now, who are those who fear the Lord? What does it mean to fear the Lord? Respect. That's exactly right. And respect is going to honor Him, going to try to represent Him properly, be obedient to Him, be submissive to Him, to be willing to be guided by His Spirit. Does the Lord hear those who fear Him? Yes. Always does. And here's my opportunity to give you my favorite verse again. <laughs> to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose, God is going to make everything work out together for that which is good. Wow! Good it is a good one. And it's something we need to keep telling ourselves, especially when we have a bad day or when we are our own bitterest enemy, when we get down in the dumps, when we discourage ourselves, or when we become lackadaisical or don't want to be as sacrificial as we ought to, and God says, your body is, my, is to be a living sacrifice. 
So what is the book of remembrance that's mentioned in this verse? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's just simply an illustration to say that God has a record of all those who are His, and also a record of everything that uh, they do. Now, you know the way I see this is a great big ledger. And there's my name on one page, and boys, he got a lot of stuff underneath that on that page, writing down everything, good and bad. You know. Well, why do I think that way? Well, when you get over the Book of Revelation. Uh, he talks about the great white throne judgment. What's going to happen? A book's going to be opened. What's that? That's a book of life. Then he said the books, plural, are going to be opened. What does that tell you? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that one. I'll, I'll chew on that a while. Uh, the one thing that, that does become very clear to me is uh, the statement that Jesus made. Many are called, but how many are chosen? Few. Few. Are the majority of people going to be saved? No, they're not. Only a few. Are the majority of people going to end up in hell? Yes, they are. That's very clear. That's why this is so serious. This is why I think in America today, we need to be concerned about these people that are talking about tolerance. Tolerance. Hogwash. We're not going to tolerate sin. We're not going to tolerate false doctrine. We're not going to tolerate immorality. We're not going to tolerate lies. And yet that's really what the people are asking us to do. Tolerate people that have different religious affiliations. What do you mean tolerate them? You mean tolerate a person that totally rejects God and made their own God that they've created with their own hands? That's ridiculous. But that's the message that's out there today. And that's the enemy that we as a church are having to face. Now in facing that enemy, we have to, we've got to be very nice. I mean, we really do. We have to be thoughtful and considerate. But the reason I'm talking this way is we better be careful that we don't let all this false propaganda begin to influence us more than we thought that it was influencing us. And one of the things that will weaken the witness of the church is when the church becomes more like the world rather than the world becoming more like the church. Somebody's got to set the, set the standard high. And... Uh, that's our, that's our privilege, and that's our responsibility. So uh, let me read the two verses that I think really apply to the answer to question number three. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 20, 12, and 15, it said, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, I think he's talking about the dead in trespasses and sins, that's people who are not Christians, were judged from the things which are written in the books according to their works. Now what does that mean? I think it means that they're going to get exactly what they asked for. They're going to get justice. That's what they're going to get, justice. And what we all need more than anything else is and those whose names are written in the book of life are those who understand the meaning of grace and mercy that God gives us through his son Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of our lives. And out of time, we'll continue next week, but we will finish this book next week. We will. And we'll get into our study of the church. Let's pray.